So I understand that it's a safer fuel for nuclear reactors. It offers a much greater yield compared to a kilo of uranium and that it also can't be used as weapons grade like U-233 can. It's a usable isotope that can be mined directly, much more safer, but I can't say that I know a lot about it. I understand it can't retain a fission reaction on its own. The key to understanding how the, the energy yield being so high is if you use a molten salt reactor, basically you can get uh, a lot greater energy return out of what fuel you put in. You could build a molten salt reactor, you could stick uranium in it. Oh, why would you use uranium at that point when you have all this thorium kicking around? Thorium's plentiful and as you say, it doesn't lend itself to uh, weapons uh, propagation issues. Now where does thorium come from? All rare earth mineral mines. I can tell you a little bit about my background that might help to give you some insight as to where my thinking is, if that would help. Okay, that'd be great. A couple of years ago, a company came to our region that was looking at doing bio biofuel electrical generation facility. They were looking at doing a number of things. They wanted to use byproducts of forestry, you know, the woody debris and the biomass that's left in the forest after the trees are harvested as potential fuel source. They were looking at potentially marketing, mixing that in with unusable coal dust. So that's the byproduct of the coal industry, of course. Not all coal is hard and shippable, so they end up with dust, which isn't a very good uh, sellable product. And they also wanted to mix it with municipal waste. So the idea here was that they would actually start to mine old landfills around the province, and they were looking first off at our region because we had the coal dust and we had woody debris from the forest industry. They came and talked to me about what do you think this should be about? How do you think we could do this? And who should we talk to? And my advice to them was we have a number of very engaged environmental activists in our region, primarily as a result of coal mine applications that happened in the late 90s, early 2000, when they were building a Chevy coal mine up here. We have this little cottage industry that lives in and around Jasper National Park who take very strong public positions on issues that affect the environment. We need to have those people at the table, was my advice, in the initial stages of the discussions. Well, of course, the reaction from this company was, well, that's exactly the people we're worried about. <laughs> we need to have a discussion about what we're going to do so that we can defend about how we're going to do it later. Said, no, no, my advice is get them to the table now. Because whatever concerns they're going to bring forward, they're going to bring forward. Better to understand them at the outset if they have any. So they trusted me. And they brought a group of people that I'd recommended from around our region together to have this discussion with them. Well, it turns out that they were less opposed to burning municipal waste than they were to having it landfill. So they absolutely loved the idea of reclaiming landfills and mining back all that that just sits there essentially degrading for the next century. They loved the idea that this could be reclaimed and then turned into energy. And then the byproduct coming out the end of this plant would actually be ash that could then be used for concrete. So pretty much a closed loop system of burning municipal waste to create energy and then using the ash to produce concrete. But it turned out by getting these people in the room to have the conversation, the environmental activists actually came out supporting the project. They loved the idea that coal dust was no longer going to be stockpiled to blow around the countryside. They loved the idea that this woody debris, a, pro a byproduct of forestry, which is also um, quite a forest fire hazard because the provincial government has changed the regulations for clearing the forest floor when you do your logging. You no longer have to bring that in and use the whole tree. Now it's only a matter of a certain circumference of the stump size that has to be used. The rest is just kind of left out in the bush. Most people don't understand that. So long story short is that by getting the right people in the room to have the fully engaged dialogue at the outset, they actually found common ground and were able to go ahead together to try and produce this plant. Now in the end, the plant never went through because the forest companies didn't want people on the land where they were harvesting the trees and my sense is they weren't all that interested in letting others see what they were doing out there on the ground. And so they wouldn't allow access to the material or to the land. And so that project never did go ahead. My point being, get the right people on the ground and have those open dialogues at the outset so you can at least understand each other's perspectives. You might not always be able to find agreement, but you've got to have the open dialogue with everybody that might potentially be affected by the industry or the idea. I'm just sort of a kind of a technologist on this. I have no industry of my own to speak of. Uh, I just think that it's important that this moves forward. I see it moving forward in a context of a much bigger piece of work that we have to do as, as, a, as the Alberta Party. 
And I'm on record as having said this, and I've blogged about this as well, and I talk about it at just about every leadership event that I'm at. I, I believe that we need to transition to the next energy economy for Alberta. That means that we've got a small window of opportunity where we need to have authentic discussions and dialogues about what comes next. You have to bring in people with people would have a different perspective so you can have a real conversation about all the issues on the table. And I see that as the role of the Alberta Party is to start fostering a more open dialogue and discussion about how do we leverage today's bountiful natural resources into a sustainable economy for tomorrow and a new energy industry, however we choose to define that. So I wouldn't take anything off the table myself. Now, a recent good example I would suggest is what the Premier's Council on the Economy just did. They put some stuff on the table that not a lot of PCs want to talk about. I'm not convinced that they have the political will to implement the recommendations that came out of um, the Minister's uh, um, advisory roundtable. But that's the other piece of the puzzle here as well. It's not just about listing. You also have the political will to make decisions and then implement. And that's where I think it get even a little bit tougher than that. But I believe it will be much more straightforward with the Alberta Party principle that says that background documents and information that are paid for with public dollars will be made, made available for public perusal will be the key to unlocking all these discussions on a provincial level. We can't be afraid of the discussions and we can't just invite our friends. There are uh, research documents that don't uh, don't get exposed to the public. Is that the way it normally works? Or? Yes. So this, yes. This, do this document is an exception then, huh? Yeah, and I've got personal experience of numerous documents that are, that are commissioned as background information for a minister or a ministry and simply languish on the minister's desk for years. One recent example that I have personal experience with has been the report on the mountain pine beetle and the impact on its forests in Alberta, as well as the impact on forest-based communities and economies in Alberta. Three years. It sat in Minister Morton's office waiting for approval to be released to the public. The reason I know about it is because we generated the background work that led to the report and encouraged the minister to put together a task force, which he did. A few of my colleagues from around forest-based communities sat on that task force. Matter of fact, one of my good friends chaired it. And then the report went to the minister and he wouldn't release it to the public. Matter of fact, probably a really good public example of this um, was Kevin Taft. Before he became a liberal MLA, he wrote a book called Shredding the Public Interest. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. No. Kevin Taft was a government employee actually working, doing work on behalf of seniors for the provincial government. And he was asked to do a study, he led a study, whereby they looked at the services available to seniors and the challenges that seniors were facing in Alberta. This was on the eve of Klein becoming Premier, actually. The report was supposed to be distributed after the report had been written and printed. And it was not seen as favorable because here were the real challenges that were seniors were facing in Alberta. Word came down that they needed to shred the report. And so they actually spent Thursday and Friday and through the weekend shredding the hard copies of the report. Yeah, Kevin Taft kept the copy. He quit the government, he wrote a book called Shredding the Public Interest where he told the story of that report and what had happened as a result of it. So this is not some fantasy, this is reality in Alberta, which is why the Alberta Party has established a premise and a direction that reports that are generated with the public dollar will be revealed to the public in the public interest is while I was chair of the Grand Alberta Economic Region and we actually hired a few people out of Edmonton, Satya Das and Ken Chapman to do background research for us. We went and met with the people in British Columbia, Mayor McKenzie, the mayors of uh, Chetwind and the mayors of the interior of British Columbia, places like Quinnell, um, who were directly affected by this and talked to them. Because what we were looking for was to get ahead of the curve. What we'd seen happen in the forest industry in British Columbia as a result of the mountain pine beetle how can we learn lessons from there and then apply them to be proactive rather than reactive? And wrote a report, commissioned the studies, and then released those on our own website. And then we convinced the minister to do his report. He did it province-wide and wouldn't release the report. Finally, we kind of tricked Minister Morton into releasing the report when he was in White Court at a public uh, forum. I asked him if he'd be willing to comment on the report as to why it hasn't been released to the public yet. He told us it had been released to the public yet, and we knew it hadn't been. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Oh. Minister, this was at a public forum where they were actually signing a, an agreement between White Court and the county that surrounds them. So I'm sorry, Mr. Minister, but we've been waiting to see the report and the results of it. And he said, Mayor Taylor, it's in the public realm. My office report uh, released it a number of months ago. 
Oh, okay, thank you. My apologies. We went home and then we started commenting upon it. We released it ourselves. Is he ever bitter? He hasn't talked to me since. So you had a copy of the report, but it was the, the concern at that point was the public couldn't see it. That's exactly right. And then, of course, the recommendations contained within the report. And that's the other piece of it, right? These reports will come with recommendations about actions. And that's where the government really tends to get a little bit skittish if the recommendations don't align with their already existing policy or if they don't believe they want to move in that direction. So in the Mountain Pine Beetle report, as an example, they had their strong recommendations that they needed to work with those, those communities who are overly reliant on the forest industry as an economic driver. And primarily located along the eastern slopes of the Rockies, all the way from High Prairie to uh, um, Crow's Nest Pass. Shortly after that, some of the forest industries in High Prairie started closing down, and they had no transitional economy in place, and they hadn't given any thought to the recommendations contained within the report about helping to diversify the economies. And, and yet it was all there. The recommendations were there, third-party independent studies, independent rec recommendations, funded by our tax dollars through the government. So is that something when someone is elected as um, an MLA, suddenly they have access to a, a library of material that we as citizens don't have? Is that what the experience is like? It is, and not just MLA. Sometimes it's only accessible by cabinet ministers. And that's a key difference between what the Alberta Party is proposing and what currently exists in government. This idea of transparency, it's not just a mythical buzzword. Um, there's a lot of activity, a lot of discussion that takes place behind caucus doors, away from the prying eyes of the media and away from the prying eyes of the public. When we ask questions in the public forum, we're often told by caucus members, don't worry about it, we had those tough discussions behind caucus doors. And then we come out of caucus doors and they come up with a united voice, because right now we have a party whip system, where essentially you don't vote against your government, you're whipped into the line by the party whip and you're expected to vote the party line all the way down the line. And the public doesn't get to see these supposedly tough discussions that took place in caucus. This issue of thorium, it's not enough just to get the reports done. It's not enough just to have the dialogue take place. It has to happen in a public forum, and we have to be willing to accept the results of the studies that we hear and the recommendations. Now, if we choose not to act on them, that's, you know, that's government's right. Yeah. But you choose to say you're not acting on them, and this is why, not simply bury the report and don't share it with the public that funded it. Specifically then to uh, Lifter and Thorium as a fuel, could, could I ask you to commit on like commissioning a report on that subject? Like, is that a reasonable uh, request? Well, it, it is and it isn't, and I'll say why. For one, I don't know enough about it to say how much of a priority it is, because again, there's a whole list of priorities that a government would establish once you get in and understand what's on the base and what's not. For all I know, there's already a report sitting there. I don't like to just commit to doing something until I fully understand it. And as I said to you at the outset, I'm just starting to learn about thorium. My governance experience is I don't have all the answers. And if you have a politician who thinks they do, don't vote for that person. But I'm willing to surround myself with people that are much smarter than me and have expertise in these areas. So the first thing that I can commit to and would commit to is gaining understanding of what this is bringing experts into the room to have this discussion because it would be in a broader discussion of our next energy economy. And I would suggest that everything needs to be on the table. What's happening with oil sands? What's happening with natural gas? What's happening with uh, uh, bioeconomy? Right. Which where I would suggest include also ensuring that what's on the table is hydroelectric generation and nuclear. My concern, and it sounds like we're past this now because at least you know specifically uh, what I'm talking about. I'm not just talking about nuclear in general. It would include specifically lifter and not just nuclear in a, a broader category, right? Because there's today's nuclear reactors and then there's what can potentially be built with molten salt reactors. Very, very different things, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. I also believe, uh, and I would support, that we have to understand that a private sector solution is out there. It has to make good business sense. And so I would be most interested in having an examination of all the potential options that are on the table, not just inclusionary ones. Some things will not be popular to discuss. They need to be there as well. Uh, for example, there are some new types of green energy that are coming forward that people are concerned about the adverse effects on the environment that we hadn't realized 10 years ago. Location of certain plants and transmission of electricity and who's going to be benefiting from the electrical generation that's produced and who's going to be uh, paying for the transmission costs. Like I'm talking a holistic discussion about how we 
transition to a new energy economy where it's all on the table for discussion and we have a clear understanding of the decisions that are made by government and why, who's to benefit, who's to pay, and what's in the overarching long-term interests of the next 21st century economy here in Alberta. Those are the kinds of conversations that I'm really interested in leading, both as leader of the Alberta party and potentially premier of our province, because I believe that's where the responsible decisions will take place. Most of the information I have on uh, Lifter is of a very technical nature. What's the easiest way for you to digest stuff? You can imagine the amounts of information that cross my table. Executive summaries, which have the background information so that it piques my curiosity, I can go and research it further. Certainly annotated background information if I want to go further yet. The challenge with the video is you can't get further into the depth that you would yeah. with a 5 or 10 page written report. But I wouldn't want to pretend that I can take hours to watch videos unless I find an interest or a reason to go deeper. So I wouldn't want to pretend. It's cool. I've got six hours of video from Washington, Glenn. Oh, it's it's just killer. Okay, yeah, isn't um, that the thanks. challenge? Editing, right? Thanks a lot for your time. This is um, fantastic. And I appreciate you being patient so that we could catch up and close this loop. And I'd be less than remiss as reminding you that there is a leadership convention on May 27th, 28th, and I'm looking for support. So if you found anything at all to believe in, either from Sunday or from today's conversation, I appreciate your support. Well, you did you did quite well on Sunday, and uh, we'll be participating online. Thank you, Gordon. Have a great afternoon. You too. And enjoy your weekend. Okay, thanks. Take care, Glenn. Bye. Hang Bye on. now.